More persistent rain moving through Northern Ireland into much of Scotland. To the south of that, showers into Wales in the southwest, but in between the showers, some sunshine, and the sun comes out once again in the southeast with temperatures here of 23 Celsius. Average temperatures towards the northwest, where it will stay windy with the risk of gales in the far north. Those winds ease by the start of Wednesday with uh, some early morning sunshine for many. But Storm Agnes is winding itself up in the Atlantic and that's going to bring a spell of wet and windy weather during Wednesday afternoon and evening. Risk of widespread gales, especially around Irish Sea coasts where there's the chance of significant disruption on Wednesday afternoon and evening. The temperature's rising. Boxed what you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London-Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. I just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. And a very good evening. Welcome to Farage on GB News. But as you can see, Nigel's not here. No, he's having a well-earned break. He's out fishing. We'll be talking about that a bit later. But I'm in charge all week, and we have got an action-packed, full-on show. First of all, we're going to be talking about Lampedusa with Mark White. The implications, what's really going on? What does this look like over the next six to 12 months? HS2, frankly, is it time for the whole thing to be derailed? And my favourite topic, net zero. We've got a great guest, John Caldwell, to talk about that because the polls show that actually the Prime Minister may be onto a thing. All of that to come, but first up, it's the news with Polly Middlehurst.
Richard, thank you. The top story this hour, the Metropolitan Police has launched an investigation after receiving a number of sex offence allegations against the comedian Russell Brand. The force says the cases aren't recent and no arrests have been made. It follows an investigation by Channel 4's dispatches, The Times and Sunday Times. The comedian denies all the accusations against him made by four women. Also in the news, thousands of passengers could have their flights cancelled or delayed after London Gatwick Airport introduced a temporary limit on flights. It's after an outbreak of coronavirus among air traffic control staff. There'll be a limit of 800 flights a day until Sunday, which includes both departure and arrival flights. The army, which was on standby to help the Metropolitan Police, has now been stood down. It's after a significant number of counter-terrorism firearm officers stepped back from their duties after a colleague was charged with murder over the shooting of Chris Cabber in Sun South London last year. The force says enough officers have now returned to armed duties to meet its counter-terrorism responsibilities without military help. The Greater Manchester Mayor says the North shouldn't have to pay for the government's mismanagement of HS2. Rishi Sunak is refusing to guarantee that Manchester will connect with HS2 with a decision expected to be announced before the Tory party conference next week. Now, the Home Secretary is due to call for unity amongst Western leaders tomorrow to combat global migration. Visiting the United States, Suella Bravman will tell an audience in Washington that other countries may have something to learn from the UK's innovative approach to migration. She's questioning whether legal frameworks designed more than 50 years ago are still fit for purpose. One million NHS appointments have been cancelled since December because of strikes in England. Last week's industrial action by junior doctors and consultants means the country's reached the milestone. Another double strike is scheduled for next week. The Health Secretary Steve Barclay has labelled it grim and says medics have received a fair and reasonable pay offer. And finally, a space capsule carrying soil from the surface of an asteroid has smashed down to Earth and been recovered by NASA. The sample was collected by Oresis Rex before making the 1.2 billion mile journey back to Earth. It was parachuted through the Earth's atmosphere and it landed in the desert in Utah in the United States. Scientists are hoping the sample inside may shed light on the formation of our solar system and even perhaps the origin of life on Earth. You're with GP News across the UK on TV, in your car, on your digital radio, and now on your smart speaker by saying play GP News. This is Britain's News Channel. Thank you, Polly. Well, welcome to Farage on GP News. But Nigel is away, as I say. He's out down in Cornwall. He's fishing and the rumour is he's actually been catching things today. I think we can see on the screen a picture of Nigel with a huge smile on his face. Yes, he's caught his first fish. Who knows how many more there is in the week. But the good news is that whilst he's away, while the cat's away, yes, the Tice will play. I'm in charge for the next four nights and we have got a full-on action-packed show for you. We're going to be talking about your views, opinions, controversy, controversial issues and hopefully have some fun along the way. The first big issue we've got to talk about is the continuing migrant crisis. It feels to me that this situation is getting worse and worse. We're going to be talking to Mark White down on the island, the Italian island of Lampedusa, in a couple of minutes. But I just want to give you my thoughts on this. It's all very well, the Home Secretary being in New York, saying that it's no longer fit for purpose, this, this UN 51 convention, it's 50 years old, 70 years old. It's not good enough, Home Secretary. The people of Britain want to know how you and the Prime Minister are going to stop the boats. Who's going to show the leadership, not only in Britain, but across the whole of the European Union, in order to stop the boats? Because otherwise, what's this going to look like in six months, in 12 months' time? How many more tens of thousands are going to come across the English Channel? How many more hundreds of thousands are going to come across the Mediterranean to Italy? Already this year, it's September, there's some 130,000-plus have left North Africa 
and have arrived in Italy, very often through this island of Lampedusa, that, by the way, is closer to North Africa than to Italy. How many more are going to come over the next three months and across other routes across the Mediterranean? I'm absolutely convinced the only way you're going to stop this is you've got to pick up and safely take back. You've got to push back. We know it works because guess what? It worked in Australia. They did it and the boats stopped coming. And yes, they took a bit of flack for it. They took a bit of grief from all the lefties, you know, all the heart-wrenching people, but the boat stopped. And it's actually the kind and compassionate thing to do. It's the right thing to do to stop the boats. We can talk about the aftermath of all of that, but at the moment, confidence amongst the British people in the Prime Minister's pledge to stop the boats is waning. We've got demonstrations at hotel after hotel, and my point to you, it's not good enough. So the question I'm asking you today is, is the EU abandoning Italy on the migrant crisis? You know the email address. It's a special one, farage at gbnews.com, or tweet hashtag Farage on GB News. Well, let's go live, first of all, in the show to Lampedusa, where our home security editor, Mark White, is there on the island. Mark, a very good evening to you. I know you've had a busy day. Look, first of all, Mark, what are conditions like that you've discovered on the island, where you've now got, I think, 11, 12,000 arrived in the last 12, 14 days against a population of 6,000? What's the mood, what's the feeling, what's the security and the safety of the citizens on the island? Well, certainly things are far calmer on the island than they were just a, a week ago when we had many thousands of people still here. We have had, over the last three days, some quite strong winds out in the Mediterranean that has stopped uh, these boats from coming across. That's due to continue until about Wednesday. We've seen it, of course, many times in the English Channel. When the weather improves, then we're expecting another surge of these boats to come from North Africa. In the meantime, the Italian authorities are getting their troops uh, in uh, place. We saw, as we arrived in Lampedusa last night, dozens of Italian police officers arriving at the airport there to help reinforce the hundreds of officers who are already here. The Red Cross is here in significant numbers and being bolstered all the time as well. It is an island that is bracing for many thousands more to come in the coming weeks. They've had 62,000 migrants come to Lampedusa since the 1st of June, and there is no sign of that stopping anytime soon, Richard. And, Mark, how quickly does it take uh, the authorities to process the arrivals on the island and move them to Italy? Is that a matter of days, weeks? Yeah, it, it doesn't take long at all, actually. I mean, it took a, a bit of a while um, last week when we had such a surge uh, of 11,000 people coming across in 10 days. At one point, the migrant uh, camp run by the Red Cross had 7,000 migrants inside that camp. It's designed to hold only 400, and that took them a while to process them. But normally, uh, when they do it, they're fairly quick. They send out uh, a ferry in the morning, a ferry in the evening, carrying about 400 people each time to the Italian mainland. But there is the wider question, of course, of when they reach the Italian mainland. Italy says they feel like they've been abandoned by the European Union, that no one is prepared to properly burden share and take these thousands of migrants uh, away from Italy to other countries in the European Union. And that's my actual question, actually, to the audience, Mark, is, is the EU abandoning Italy? But essentially, Mark, looking to the future now, what happens from here? Are we going to see a situation where actually EU nations are essentially completely abandoning the whole idea of freedom of movement, the Schengen zone, and they're going to have to put up the borders? They're going to have to have border posts, fences, I mean, this situation is not tenable on the current basis. You've got almost a 50% increase in arrivals in Italy alone. Where does this go over the next six to 12 months, Mark? 
Well, I think Brussels would definitely deny that there is any end in sight to the Schengen Agreement. They uh, clearly prize that uh, uh, particular uh, policy, that freedom of movement throughout European Union countries very highly. But lawmakers are meeting within uh, the coming days to decide uh, on a way forward and to uh, sort of map out um, more coherently for European countries when they can actually uh, detract from uh, the border uh, policy and put up borders between member states. We're seeing it already. Uh, Austria threatening now uh, that within days they are going to have border checks uh, with Italy because they are very concerned about migrants making their way through Italy uh, into Austria. Uh, we're seeing the same with France. They've stepped up uh, policing of their border uh, with Italy as well. Germany uh, is uh, doing likewise. Uh, so uh, borders are popping up all the time. I mean, it happened as a, a, a clearly a significant issue during uh, the pandemic uh, when borders sprung up right across uh, the European Union. Uh, but even after the pandemic pandemic subsided, uh, we still had a number of these countries on security grounds, on fears about uh, uh, mass migratory transit uh, issues, have put up these border checks. And that is really denting this uh, Schengen model. And it is going to have to be something uh, that the European Union lawmakers uh, are quite inventive about a way forward, because at the moment, it just doesn't seem that it's working at all. Uh, Mark, thank you very much indeed. It feels to me that once again Brussels will be completely out of touch with this situation. I can see individual EU nations rapidly erecting borders and frankly uh, abandoning Italy. And I don't know where that goes, but if these numbers continue, we are facing serious, serious issues. And of course, we know that many of those who are arriving, coming over the Mediterranean, they've got the United Kingdom in their sights. They want to come here. They think that we have the most generous, welcoming accommodation. And I think the truth is, not only do they think that, but they're probably right. Well, that was Mark White on the island of Lampedusa. But now uh, we're going to look at a slightly different angle on this. I'm delighted to be joined down the line by Dean Morgan, who's the director at Visa Immigration Consultants First Migration. Dean, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this situation on the asylum seekers is, uh, is almost out of control now. Now, I know uh, you operate on sort of the lawful uh, applications to come to the United Kingdom, but many people on the other side of this debate, Dean, have been sort of saying, well, we need safe and legal routes and that that will stop this. What are your thoughts on that? How do safe and legal routes actually work? And do you think that that would stop or mitigate or dramatically reduce this situation, this crisis? I personally don't think it would, and good evening, Richard. I mean, the problem that you have is to claim asylum, you need to make your way to the UK lawfully to do so. And when you arrive here, you speak to a border official, you claim asylum, typically, they'll give you an asylum interview, and then they'll notify you how long you can expect to wait a decision. The problem is the people coming in on small, small boats, I mean, since 2015, according to statistics, there's been 81,000 people have come in through small boats in five years. Now, because of the asylum backlog, only 13% of those have received a decision. But here's the shocking thing. 86% of those received humanitarian protection. Now, the problem is, is that the people that are coming on the boats can't get a visitor visa or a student visa or a skilled worker visa to come here lawfully. The only way they can get here to claim asylum is via boats and going through 15 plus safe you know, countries to get to their country of preference and choice. So many people on the sort of the left side of this debate who want to welcome more asylum seekers into the UK, they say, well, well, in Italy, we should have a processing centre that uh, essentially creates a safe and legal route from Italy or indeed from North Africa to the UK. What happens, though, Dean, if that was set up, if people think that's a good thing? I frankly, I'm far from convinced. But what happens to those who who get rejected through that route because actually they're just an economic migrant. They, they haven't come from a war zone. What do they do? Well, the Italians would just have to deal with the problem. I mean, that's the, that's the, the left solution to this. Um, and, and that's the problem. I mean, the only solution can be global. 
the reason that people are migrating is, I mean, you've got great powers, the West versus the East, shall we say, with Wagner in Niger and things like that, that are playing power, geopolitical power battles, civil wars in what, Afghanistan, you've got Eritrea, Central African Republic, Syria, the list goes on and on. Someone's financing and providing arms to both sides. So, you know, if they didn't, one side would win. So, you know, the destabilization of South America economically forcing migrants into North America, you see the same pattern with Africa coming into Europe and same with the Middle East as well. So this isn't going to be solved unless it's on a global level. And the problem is we're a tiny island, 70 well, I, million people, and everyone wants to live in the, the, the bottom corner of it. I don't see how just bringing people to the UK solves any problems or, or helps I think anyone. that's the point, Dean, and the reality is that if someone gets rejected under this, this process of safe and legal routes that the other side of this debate think is the answer, I think they're just going to keep on coming. I think they'll just keep on uh, paying the vile people, traffickers and the smugglers, and so we'll still have the boats. And then those people will be saying, well, what next? And eventually, Dean, I think we have to get to my solution, which is you have to pick up and take back. And then you start to deal with uh, the situation, the crisis in, in Africa and some of those other nations. I totally agree, Richard. I mean, look, the problem is we, you know, the rules, you know, as it said in the news then, 50 years ago, what's the population of the world right now? And how many people live on under a dollar a day? Now, if I lived in those countries, I, I, I hate hypocrisy. I would have left and I would have made my way as an economic migrant for a better life for myself and my family. In my opinion, you'd be foolish not to. But the problem is, if you take everyone from the third world and put them in the first world, well, the first world becomes the third world. And the other problem that we have is, is that people that show total disregard for the law, it's not the best foundation to build your new life in the UK. You haven't followed your process. Um, but, you know, it's again, this being a global problem, it needs a global solution. It's like saying the UK needs to solve the global, you know, the, the, the global kind of climate crisis. But if yeah, we produce 1% you... of CO2 and China and India are building coal power stations better than we what can it... build bridges. Dean, you're right. What it needs is some proper leadership, some world leading leadership. And I think... Uh, that our Prime Minister should show that. I think we've got to pick up and safely take back. I think we're entitled to do it under the international treaties that I've read. If we do that, then actually we can give that leadership to the EU leaders. I think they need a lot of that. Dean Morgan, thank you so much for joining me here on Farage on GB News. Look, this story is not going away. And until someone has the courage, the leadership, the decisive direction to do that, the situation will get worse and worse and more and more will come. Coming up, Tony Long, author of Lethal Force, My Life as the Met's Most Controversial Marksman. You won't want to miss it. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too.
People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. I just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to Farage on GB News. I'm standing in for Nigel all of this week. He is taking a well-earned break. Earlier in the show, I asked you, is the EU abandoning Italy on the migrant crisis? And it's fair to say, plenty of reaction. One viewer says, yes, but they've abandoned every single country when it, con when it comes to controlling borders. It's a complete mess. Victor says, the so-called Schengen Agreement will go down as one of the greatest disasters in history. I have to say, I think there's a lot of truth in that, Victor. And then finally, Muriel says, the EU's got no intention whatsoever of stopping the migration to Italy. Nothing will be done until it's too late for all of Europe. Muriel, I hope, I hope that's not the case. We've got to do better than that. We've got to show some proper leadership. My concern at the moment is, frankly, there's none of it anywhere. Anyway, on to the other big story today. Following the, uh, the charging of a police officer, a Met officer, for murder uh, over the killing of Chris Cabber, uh, which is now uh, under, um, uh, under charge, uh, clearly we've had a situation where many, many uh, of the armed forces, uh, armed officers in the Met have been really concerned about the implications for themselves, and actually they went on strike. I mean, this is a seriously dramatic thing to do. Uh, but there's nothing like actually speaking to someone who's actually been there, who knows what it's like to be uh, an armed force, uh, a, an officer with the Met, uh, with a firearm, and actually facing the situation where you might have to pull the trigger. So I'm delighted to be joined in the studio for the first time by Tony Long, who is a former Met police specialist, firearms officer and instructor and author of a book that I've got here, Lethal Force, my life as the Met's most controversial marksman. Tony, uh, very warm welcome. Your first time uh, here at GB News. So, Thank you uh, for this situation, me. no, great to have you with us. In a sense, you know exactly what this must be like. Uh, you're facing a, a, a critical decision. Uh, you're highly trained, highly skilled. What would be going through the mind of a firearms officer, specialist counterterrorism officer? with the Met facing this sort of situation? Uh, I think I have to be a bit careful here because... You can't talk about can't the actual talk case. About the actual talk about case. the principle of, of what it's like, because, you know, you, you've been there. Arguably, you're the Met's most controversial firearms officer. Yeah, I'd like to say that that was added by the publishers, not myself. I'm not quite that uh, immodest. But, um, I mean, it, it's, it's, I'd like to say it's a really difficult decision to shoot. And I've been involved in one situation, the last one, the one that resulted in me being charged with murder, which was extremely difficult. The first two incidents I was involved in couldn't really have been easier. The first one involved a man who had killed a woman, was holding a six-year-old child hostage, and when I came into the room, having climbed through the window um, and confronted him, he stabbed a six-year-old little girl. That's not a difficult decision. That's gold standard. You know, there is no choice. You have to shoot him. The second incident I was involved with, I was confronted by three 
armed robbers in the process of robbing a security van, all wearing balaclavas and all carrying guns. That's not a difficult decision. When they all start turning at once, the decision-making process is done for you. Uh, the last situation I found myself in um, was, was more akin, perhaps, to you know, what uh, this officer's gone through, insofar as um, I didn't see a gun. Uh, the intelligence that we were acting of um, had come by uh, means that are inadmissible in a court of law sure. and are covered by uh, the Ripper Act. Now, I don't know how that information was come by. I don't know whether it's phone taps or whatever, but it's a technical source that isn't admissible in But you court. have to trust the intelligence. You, you have to trust that intelligence. Yeah. And, the, and that intelligence suggested that he had uh, two fully automatic Mac-10 submachine guns, uh, which fire at a rate of about 1,200 rounds per minute. Uh, we knew that they were very close to a location where they were going to rob and murder rival uh, Colombian drug dealers and uh, steal their cocaine off them. And we were given instructions to stop the vehicle. Um, the body language of the man in the back seat convinced me that he was armed or uh, uh, armed himself. Um, and combined with the intelligence we were given, I had to make the decision to fire without actually seeing a gun. And, now, and that's a leap of faith. And that's a leap of faith. And I mean, that is a situation that 99.99% that of the population just cannot really comprehend how difficult that is. And how much of a, a split-second decision is that? Is it, is it, it, I mean, it is split-second. I mean, it's very difficult. But it's all based on... So, for instance, one of the things that was thrown at me was that I made the decision to fire in 0 point something of a second. And that was based on um, a scientific reconstruction uh, based on what we call a black box in the police vehicle that was able to geo-position the vehicle and combined with video footage. Uh, so they did a computer reconstruction. Uh, in point of fact, what they were saying was, because I fired 0.05 seconds after my vehicle came to rest, I couldn't have had time to assess the situation. In point of fact, I had 10 seconds prior to it, if you actually looked at it. Um, but the, the, you touched upon something that's very true, that's very... Um, relevant there is that, I say ordinary people, I'm not being dismissive of people that haven't been in that situation, but people that have been in that situation have a totally different understanding to lay, lay persons or, say, yeah, lawyers. You've been, you've been yeah. highly trained, highly skilled, and, and obviously, in a sense, that training tells you about the intelligence you're going to get and all of that. But I, do you understand... The officers that have, have uh, sort of essentially went on strike or almost went on strike. Do you understand their anxiety? Absolutely. How, how absolutely. tough is it? Can I, can I just say right, right away, there are something in the region of 40,000 officers in the Metropolitan Police, of which about 2,500, perhaps a few more, are trained in the use of firearms. Those 2,500 are all volunteers. Yes. You can't really strike from a voluntary... You can withdraw your labour. Withdraw your labour, And, and right. the reason that they've done that is, is, is it's actually written... Um, it's actually an instruction that if you come on duty to conduct an armed operation or simply to go out on patrol with a firearm, you are duty-bound to notify your senior, senior officers if, for any reason, you don't feel fit to conduct. Sure. It might just be for a day. It might just be you've had a raving you know, row with your missing before be you came to work. might be multiple reasons why, actually, yeah, absolutely. it's better that you don't put yourself so in that these, stress So what these officers are saying is that... Um, this is... Officer, the officer that was involved in this shooting has now been charged with murder. Um, I would say that he is the straw that broke the camel, camel's back. You know, there, the, the reality is that there have been lots of officers between me retiring in 2008 um, and today that have found themselves in similar situations. Officers that have been under investigation for over two years, then it gets to court having gone through the Crown Prosecution Service, um, and then the Crown Prosecution Service withdraw the charges because they say, they say there's no realistic chance of a conviction. Well, these are highly trained, very expensively trained officers um, who have acted in accordance with their training um, and are basically being punished uh, be because there is no time limit on these investigations. And do you, so do you feel the support from the leadership of the Met is sufficient. I think in... I think it's atrocious. You think it's atrocious? I think it's atrocious. Was it better sort of 15, 20 years ago? Not really. Um, I handed my blue card in in 2005 um, in a similar thing. It was the only other time in the history of the, the unit that we've done that. And we only did it for a matter of hours because Sir John Stevens, who was the commissioner at the time, came down, rolled up his sleeves, 
uh, like you know, that proper old school cop. I said, I used to carry a gun when I was on the flying squad. I know what you're doing. Leave it with me. I'm going to deal with it. And we all rather naively, because it was the first time it ever happened, sort of went along with it, and it, nothing right. did happen. And then in the intervening years, um, later commissioners, and, and I think uh, I think it was Hogan Howe um, and Cameron when he was uh, prime minister. They set promised that they were going to look at some of the inequalities that happen when police officers are investigated. And one of the things I'd like to say is that and I'm not equating what we do with brain surgery, um, but if, for instance, you look at other professional bodies like, say, paramedics or doctors, if a paramedic or a doctor make a genuine mistake, they misdiagnose somebody and, and therefore give them the wrong treatment, treatment, or under pressure accidentally give somebody the wrong medicine yes and that person dies nobody considers prosecuting those people for killing somebody they will be investigated it will go before a tribunal and, they, and some form of resolution will come up whereby they'll be have to go through a re-education process where they'll have to have a mentor with them for a certain well, period of time. They're making a, a, a really difficult, highly skilled Absolutely. precision judgment. Exactly. And sometimes they might get it slightly yeah. now, wrong, so there's lessons to be learned. Now, if on the other hand, you know, we're talking about the nurse that was recently convicted, who we know now was deliberately killing babies, or Harold Shipman, that's murder. That's different. Yes, that's different. But what, but Clearly premeditated. But what, what is happening, and what has been happening now for some considerable time, is that the IPCC, or whatever they're called this week, because every time they mess up, they just rebrand. Um, basically, they've they investigate for as long as they like. They're under no restrictions. Police officers are, are, are you know having to to tolerate that. And then when they are acquitted, if they are charged, they then get. A, two slices of the cherry because the, the investigating body turns around to the Met Police and says, we want them done under discipline uh, for gross misconduct. So and they then suffer a second trial. So I just think that perhaps they should look at, you know, the what, way... What's the do. answer, just, just quickly? What's the solution? Should it be only one trial? Do we need a change in the law to provide more support? I just think there needs to be a realistic look because these, are, these aren't rank amateurs. These are professional pe people that have gone through months and months of training. To go from, to go from a, a unarmed officer on the street and become an armed response vehicle operator is something like 15 weeks of training. That's massive compared with other forces around the country. If you then, after a year or so or two years on the, on the ARVs, the armed response vehicles, you decide you want to then become a counter-terrorist SFO, it's another 21 weeks of training, nearly six months of training. And what we're doing is the moment they conduct the training, the moment they do what they've been trained to do, they're accused of murder, they're suspended for three or four years Tony, or I more. Uh, I admire anybody. Uh, this must be such a highly skilled and, and some of the most challenging decisions that anybody could could make uh, in any form of service in the UK. Tony Long, thank you so much for coming in, sharing your thoughts. That is Tony Long. He is a former Met specialist firearms officer and instructor and author of the book Lethal Force. Thank you, Tony. Well, coming up, HS2. I've never been a fan. I always think it's the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong price. Could it be axed from where to where? We'll be talking to Christian Woolmar. He's a fan, I think, after the break. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching.
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes, and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio, and online, Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m., only on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Farage at GB News with me, Richard Tice. Well, we're struggling to get Christian Walmart to talk about HS2 down the line. Maybe he's trying to help uh, them sort of sort out the costs. I mean, this thing is just a catastrophe. So hopefully we'll speak to Christian a bit later. But the other one of my big bugbears is the issue of net zero. And the Prime Minister last week making a really bold uh, new statement, new direction for the government. And some people have been very uh, enthusiastic about it and one part of his party. But actually, a lot of people uh, have been very concerned about it. And later in the show, we're going to be talking to John Caldwell, a significant donor to the Conservative Party, uh, with his views, because it seems that he's saying he's not going to donate any more to the party if that's the direction of travel of the Prime Minister. Well, there is actually a poll out today that seems to indicate that Mr Caldwell may be going down the wrong track, because the Conservatives are up five on the back of the Prime Minister's uh, shift on the issue of net zero. Now, I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by Laurie Labour and Langton, who's an economist and environmental policy researcher, to talk about this. Uh, Laurie, thanks for being with us. So this is a, it's a really significant moment in the net zero debate. I've been very outspoken. I think it's the, I think it's the wrong thing at the wrong price in the wrong time frame. I'm very concerned that actually it's going to send our jobs and money abroad and that actually ordinary families up and down the country cannot afford it. And the Prime Minister, finally, he's basically admitted that is the case. But, of course, uh, net zero is written into law, isn't it? Mm -hmm. In the UK, you've got the Climate Change Act of 2008, and then you've got the amendment to that in 2019-20, mm -hmm. after Theresa May. So the Prime Minister's probably going to face lots of legal challenges coming in all directions from those who think he's got this completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he probably will. Um, I think he should also face legal challenges from people who want Britain's industry to return. So I got a, I got a cab over here. It was a black cab. It was one of the electric ones, right? That cab was made in Coventry, I think. But it was produced by a Chinese company called Geely. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, then a shell company that does the actual cab building. I think that's ridiculous. Two things are going on there. One, electric vehicles are increasingly being brought in globally. This is a new wave. It's not something that's been pushed down our throats. Private companies, automotive companies, want us to have electric vehicles, right? In the same way that companies benefited when we moved from horses to cars in the first place. The second thing that's happening is China is winning those opportunities. 
per the black cab example. I think it is outrageous that black cabs in London are made by a Chinese company. So what Lewis, the... And don't get me wrong, I've got an electric car myself, mm -hmm. and, and yes, I love it. You know, I'm not a great fan of noise, so for me that suits. Mm -hmm. My issue is, it's the cost of them. Mm -hmm. And the reason, that the, the, the reason the Chinese cars are so much cheaper is because they've got a much lower energy cost because they're getting their energy, their electricity from coal-fired generating power stations, of which they're building 200 of them as we speak. But they are also installing more renewables capacity per month than most Western countries are installing over a course of years. The other reason why they're cheap is because of subsidy from Beijing, right? So we, we need to understand here that another reason why European EVs are more expensive is because, and I'm going to be completely honest here, a lot of countries in the West, including the UK, also including the major European manufacturing companies like Germany, they didn't anticipate this opportunity fast enough. So some um, car companies are, are playing catch up, right? We need all we can do to ensure that they catch up quicker. Yeah, but, and but, having... here's the issue. But, but here's the issue is that uh, you're having to give, the government's having to give huge subsidies. It's given them to BMW, uh, to, to mm -hmm. uh, Jaguar Land Rover, mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of millions mm -hmm. of our cash. It's not government money, it's our cash. Mm -hmm. And the number of jobs employed in, those, uh, in that process is much, much less in the traditional combustion engine process. So the truth is that this rush to net zero is costing hundreds of thousands of jobs in the automotive sector alone, either directly or indirectly. Where have you got the figure from? Because the, the government's independent advisers have made it very clear that they think that the net impact on jobs, so that's just to be totally clear, the, the, we're going to get, we're going to might lose some jobs in net zero, but we'll also gain some from all the new things that are made and different processes. So the net gain, as a net gain, is between 135 and as much as 750 thousand jobs. There's a huge amount to be done, and I tell you what, there's the 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 ma maximum number, the most jobs that we could get from going towards net zero are the ones where instead of a Chinese company being the one that makes the London EV back cab, it becomes a British company. I want a Union Jack on top of the no, wind no, turbines. I, I, I want a wind... Yeah, I want a Union Jack on, stamped on the insulation that we're putting in people's... Well, it's homes. interesting. So you talk about where does the numbers come from. So I looked at the Office for National Statistics. Mm. Their data for last year shows that less than 1% of all jobs in the United Kingdom are green jobs. Mm -hmm. Less than 1%. Mm -hmm. It's less than 2% of GDP. We've all been promised all these green jobs, mm -hmm. but lots of people are entitled to ask, where are they and what's the price? And last week, I was down in Port Talbot talking to union leaders at the steel plant. Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands of great, highly skilled manufacturing steel jobs are being slain on the altar of net zero, just binned. Well, they're not... Like, th one of the biggest factors that got in the way of the, that led to the loss of jobs in industry in this country is that successive governments, Tory and Labour, did not invest in homegrown British capacity, right? We are now in a situation globally, whether we like it or not, there's nothing we can do to resist this, where industry is moving towards renewables to electric vehicles and so on. China is an example of that, the US is an example of that, EU is an example of that. Irrespective of climate change, the question is whether we I... capitalise on that and bring jobs here. The complaint to the government, if there's only 1% of the jobs are green jobs, is that they haven't done enough to bring them here. Well, because there are I green jobs in the US. The, the reason for that is we've got the most expensive electricity in the G20, as I understand. Laurie, thank you so much. We must get you back. There's I've so much to talk about on this issue. Uh, well, next up, we're actually going to shift the order. We're going to be talking to John Caldwell, the highly successful entrepreneur of the mobile phone industry, about this very issue. He's quite grumpy with the Prime Minister. Coming up on Farage at GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs and Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel.
Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to Farage on GB News. Well, the voters in the latest poll that's out just today seem to think the Prime Minister's on the right track in delaying many of the serious obligations of net zero. I want him to go much, much further. Personally, I want to scrap the whole thing. I think it's a job destroyer. I think it sends our money overseas. I think it's a catastrophe. That's nothing... You know, we can save the environment. We can protect our environment, of course. We all want cleaner air. But net zero is the wrong thing at the wrong price. But... Here is an entrepreneur, highly successful founder of Phones For You, with me, John Caldwell. Uh, a very good evening, John. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you completely disagree with me, and I think you disagree with the Prime Minister. You think he's got it completely wrong, John? I do, absolutely, and good evening to you. No, I absolutely disagree. Um, if we look at where the planet's going, and I've been studying this for about 20 years, I've got no scientific uh, experience, but what I have got is a brain that can look at all the data that's coming, that's come through over the last 20 years, and all of that suggests a real apocalyptic event or series of events over the next 20, 30 years. And do we want that actually to happen? Now, I don't agree, ab absolutely don't agree that uh, looking after the environment is not commensurate with growing wealth. Quite the reverse is true. Net zero is going to happen, no matter what, like your previous speaker said, it is going to happen. And if we're at the forefront of developing technologies and intellectual technologies and production capabilities, we can export all that over the world. Now, I've been lobbying the Conservative government now for three and a half years, asking them to create a tax-free enterprise zone to bring all the best brains from around the world to set up businesses in the UK on all forms of environmental technology, from turning the Everest, uh, the Everest mountain of plastics into whatever we can do with them, whether that's building blocks or other, or other products, right the way through from that to tidal uh, energy, anything that is environmentally friendly that can be commercially viable. Yeah, if John, we did all, you're if we did all that, you know that. If, but if, if, 
this is a business opportunity. It's a massive, massive we, we, business. John, we keep hearing that it's a great opportunity, but actually what it's doing at the moment is destroying jobs. It's sending jobs uh, overseas. We've got steel jobs down in Paul Talbot. I was down there just last week. 3,000 jobs, families, incomes being thrown on the scrap heap of net zero, John. And yet it's just 1% of green jobs. Even the Office of National Statistics says that. You're a businessman, I presume. I don't know what you do. I've run 20 or 30 different businesses. And I can tell you, at any one time, some of those businesses were really struggling because they were yesterday's cold bacon. And what we have to do is move forward to futuristic businesses. There is no doubt whatsoever that environmental technologies are the future commercially and will produce massively we massive wealth for Britain and massive job creation, providing the government incentivise people to do it now. Well, yeah, now I, that, I, I hear that, John, but the, but the reality is, John, that that's no, taxpayers' no, cash. No, no, it's not taxpayers' cash. There's no such if thing as government get, money. No, are you listening or challenging? Wait until I've made my point. If the government now launch an enterprise zone to bring businesses from all over the world, they give tax-free incentives, that costs the taxpayer not a dime because all it is is money. that It's no tax being paid, but it wasn't going to get paid anyway. And what we do is we have, say, a 10-year corporation tax holiday to give them a chance to develop the products and to invest in their businesses and start producing, and then maybe a guarantee for another 10 or 20 years that they only pay 50% of the corporation tax rate because they're in a very desirable business that's helping. Now, if we do that, that costs the taxpayer not a penny. We grow jobs, we grow exports, well, and we grow a commercial future for Britain. And yeah, the steel worker jobs are sad. Look at how many jobs we lost in the mining industry. Yeah, we cannot and, and, and the to catastrophe, old John, for communities was devastating for decades. John, I, I, I'm running out of time, John. The show is flying by, but I'm so glad you came on to put that view. This will run and run without question. Uh, John Caldor, thanks for being with us on Farage at GB News. Now, HS2, the crisis is so significant, even my guest couldn't appear. We've lost Christian Woolmer. I'm going to give you a quick view on it. I've always thought this has been a disastrous project. And if you're going to do something, uh, you know, why didn't we level up in the north? Why didn't we have HS3 from Liverpool to Hull and to Newcastle, for example? Nigel is with me on this. We've campaigned against it. The worst thing you could do is now build a train set from a suburb in London that no one's ever heard of to a suburb in Birmingham that no one's ever heard of. The answer is scrap the whole thing as far as I can see. But I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by someone who might also have a view on this. Jacob, a very good evening. Hey, good evening. <laughs> and welcome to GB News. Thank it's you very much marvelous. indeed. I've had a lot of fun, yes. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, part of the all sorts. family now. At the same time, we haven't had time to go through What the Farage, but Nigel would be furious at this What the Farage, Jacob. Uh, pubs are being told to stop using phrases like same again, or would you like a double, sir? I mean... <laughs> Seriously. Well, I, I, I don't know that I'm allowed to say this, but a single gin and tonic is a complete waste of time. There you are. You heard it here first. A single gin and tonic is a complete waste of time. Um, <laughs> what's coming up on your What's coming up? We're going to be talking about inheritance tax, because there are rumours it's going to be abolished. I think this is really important. It's a terrible tax. It's economically inefficient, and it's potentially an election winner for us. You won't like this, but an election winner for the Tories, and you're a Tory, probably, um, even if you may sometimes fly under other colours. Uh, and if Rishi goes with that, not a promise, but actually abolishes it, it's really exciting and economically beneficial. What's interesting is actually it seems as though the Prime Minister has been listening to me because I've been campaigning for years against inheritance tax. It's a grief tax. It's a horrific tax. It's a double tax on people who've saved, strived, been successful, worked hard. It's the least popular tax, I think, in the country. And it's stunningly economically inefficient because it causes people to have bad investments that they don't change because they're worried about the tax consequences yeah. of changing. So I think this is a real opportunity and it puts Labour on the Lib Dems entirely on the spot. Uh, absolutely. Talking on the spot, uh, HS2, keep it or scrap it? I've never been in favour of HS2 except when I was bound by collective responsibility and wasn't allowed to oppose it. There's quite an interesting video of Keir Starmer a few oh, years yes, ago. Oh, yes, I've seen that. Yes, uh, where actually Keir Starmer, he says uh, he was against it both on the grounds of cost and merit. But, what's but, he doing now? But your point, a suburb in London to a suburb in Birmingham, what's he going to do? Who's going to use it? 
Jacob, have a great show. Well, I've enjoyed my first show. I'll be back tomorrow night, same time, same place. Lots to go. Coming up, though, it's the weather. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, it's Aidan McGibbon here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. Today's showers ease overnight. Clear spells to come, but further rain arrives during Tuesday. Some of that, once again, will be heavy with a strong breeze, but nothing compared to Agnes. Storm Agnes, named by the Met Office because of the risk of widespread disruption into Wednesday as that arrives. Before that, it will be a breezy night, but nothing out of the ordinary. Some clear spells and the lightest winds will be towards the east and south of England. That's where we'll see some mist patches form by dawn. But patchy cloud elsewhere and that breeze will keep temperatures in the double figures in many spots. First thing, we've got some showers moving in.